Assalamu alaikum everybody. Welcome to our sixth session. We will be discussing the ninth chapter of the print. We're going to give a summary of our previous session. We'll also be providing a summary of chapter nine and then looking into the historical context discussed by Machiavelli before then going into a discussion about what this chapter is trying to say. So in chapter seven, uh, Machiavelli continues um, describing the methods of gaining principalities. He talks about how a prince gains um, or reach uh, the position of a prince is through fortune or with the arms or forces of others. He described this uh, method as something that once the prince uh, reaches uh, that position, um, it, it's really hard to maintain. But in, on his way to getting to his position, um, he won't find much difficulties because others are paving the way for him. Fortune and goodwill of people is not stable and not something reliable. And the prince in this scenario needs definitely knowledge, experience, in order when the fortune brings that position to him, he's equipped and he's ready to move on and take control of it. In chapter eight, we talked about Kivali continues describing the methods of gaining principalities, but this time not through fortune, not through the help of others, but through wickedness and cruelty. Machiavelli does not approve such an approach, and he, he described this approach that if it does help you to and bring you power or position, it does not bring you glory. In this uh, approach, you are not using mercy, you're not relying on religion, and you have no faith if you take such approach. Only um, have to use it if it's justifiable. It's only justifiable if it's basically giving a political security or if it's aimed for the greater good of people or for self-defense. Now we move on to a quick summary for chapter nine. Machiavelli in this chapter describes another way how, how a prince can come to power, and that is through the favor of fellow citizens. Machiavelli goes on and argues that each state is populated by two groups of citizens the commoners or the common people and the nobles. And he says there, will, there is always a constant or inevitable tension between these two groups. And that would lead to three results, either having a civil principality, a free state, or an anarchy where you have ungoverned chaos. So who determines uh, who to become a prince is basically the dynamics and the circumstances going in this in between these two groups. But eventually, basically, the nobles will try to elect someone among themselves to uh, to become a prince, and so that to help them achieve their goals and their ambitions. And similarly, the common people will try to elect someone among themselves to help to be protected, so they are not dominated by the nobles. And if a prince reached power by the nobles, he will face or encounter many difficulties. If the prince, on the other hand, will go reach the power through the people or the common people, that will, he will probably might uh, find it more easier to uh, maintain his estate because the, um, to satisfy the people, um, it's, um, it's easy to satisfy the people because as long as you don't harm them and you always protect them, especially that you can always make and unmake nobles, whereas with the people, you always have the same people. You cannot change your people. And uh, Machiavelli then moves on and mention how you can sort of testify your nobles, uh, and that is through uh, basically uh, measuring their inclination. Some of them, they are dependent on you, and others are independent. Those who are independent, who are, independent are the ones who you need to keep an eye on. Um, and also he ends with um, uh, making a statement that you need to always ensure that your citizens are always dependent on you and not your magistrates or those who are, who are in, um, in your proximity or who are helping you. Now I'll pass it on to Zane to discuss the first historical example. So the first um, historical example discussed by Machiavelli in this chapter is Nabis of Sparta. He took power over Sparta by executing two uh, claimants. So he was uh, the last independent ruler of Sparta uh, and, you know, um, was quite influential in uh, rebuilding a lot of its wealth and power um, before, I believe it was their battle with the Romans. The main reason that uh, Machiavelli focuses on him in this chapter 
um, is because of the way that he served the people during his time as a ruler. So, you know, um, although he didn't have a very good relationship with the nobles, having kind of uh, broken into that, uh, I guess, a sphere of power, uh, he was able to, you know, divide the states of the wealthy so that they were more accessible to other people. And that would mean that the state as a whole would be more productive. And, you know, the slaves being freed um, allowed for, um, I guess, a better kind of like trade system uh, in a lot of ways. Of course, the slave trade was very big at the time, but it would allow in like increases in uh, production in other areas and efficiency. Uh, as well as increasing his popularity and kind of stabilizing the state as a whole. Um, and he was also known to greatly tax the rich, which would, of course, uh, pit a lot of the, I guess, uh, nobles with um, connections with other powerful people in other nations against him. But in the end, it was, in his mind, better for the people of the nation and its security for the time being. Um, but because of this, he did make a number of enemies and was eventually assassinated in 192 BC by the Aetolian League. Machiavelli gives another historic example, and that is the Guracci brothers. Before giving this example, I quickly say that Machiavelli mentioned the, the proverb that says, if you build on uh, people, it looks as if like you're building on mud. And he gives this example as well as the other, uh, another example, which Mariam will discuss. And so we will give the historical um, um, background of it and you see how we can link this to the proverb. So um, the Gracchi brothers, they are uh, Tiberius and Gaius. So they are the grandchildren of Scipio uh, Africanus from the mother side. So they were a well-off family, if you like, and they are well, well uh, connected to the Roman uh, politics. Um, they sort of, you can say, they pretty much followed up the footsteps of their father. And their, 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 their mentality of reform and sort of uh, protecting the poor or the lower class of the people, um, in that sense, they followed very much their father. And being the tribunes, they wanted to sort of give occupation to the lower class and particularly the veterans, because you will see, um, we'll discuss just in the next slide, how um, the veterans really did not have uh, um, much money, if you like, did not have much wealth. They didn't even, um, they even had to buy their own um, clothes and all their own equipments for the war, if you like. So um, Tiberius the Gracious, basically, um, he participated in the uh, Third Punic War and he was um, like uh, very um, well equipped and participated in, in uh, many army um, actions, if you like. Um, and then when he came back to Rome, he started to observe people. And he saw how like, uh, you know, when they acquire a particular state, they will bring that the, the, the conquered land, they will bring with them slaves. And those slaves will be used basically as farmers and like, be, be, because they will be having very low fears. Whereas the people, um, the low class of the people who are farmers, um, they basically were um, gradually, their lands were stripped of them because they did not have much um, power. They did not have much um, uh, people who can, you know, come and work for them. So he started to observe and he was saying, he was witnessing how um, the lower class, if you like, or the peasants uh, were suffering. So um, he thought about uh, this land reform, which is basically an idea where he can put a limit or a cap of how much people can um, uh, buy lands, if you like, and also how much they can rent. So apparently back in the days, there was a law that had a limit on how much people can, uh, how many lands they can have and how many uh, they can buy and own. However, uh, the nobles or the, if you like, the people higher in the states, they were sort of like manipulating the law or even like coming, um, bringing other people with different names so they can gain more and more lands. Uh, Tiberius tried to sort of put this um, to an end and he sort of tried to put a bill for a land reform. But however, the patricians or people, the senators, if you like, were not pleased with, with the, such a law. And that um, TG, that is that TG is basically for Tiberius Gracchus. So Tiberius Gracchus and 300 plus of his followers were murdered and thrown in the Tiber River. And apparently some accounts say that, that 
name sort of go back to Tiberius. However, his brother was more practical and the senator were sort of more um, afraid of him, if you like. And he had more reforms, not just the land reform, but many other um, uh, ideas he brought into the land. And he, again, he sort of took the people as a way to sort of uh, reach um, his way up um, to the Senate, if you like. So he reopened the, the land reform program. He also even made a court to judge the Senate. And he also put cap on uh, grain prices. But one thing, one reform that basically set him to death is that he tried to give non-Romans Italian right. And in this instant, the poor people turned against him. And unfortunately, this, they set out to kill him. So there is two, two different accounts onto his end. Some people said um, that he suicided and he actually ordered his own slave to kill him. And other accounts says that he was executed by his own slave. Third example uh, Machiavelli gives is uh, Giorgio Scully. And so Giorgio Scully was a, just a rule maker. He didn't really have much power, but during the uh, Trumpy revolts, uh, Michel de Lando, who was the head of the revolt, gave him this power and status. But to be able to understand this, we need to kind of understand what this revolt was. Florence at the time was ruled by an oligarchy. And this oligarchy wasn't made of political players as such, but guilds. So people with the same job would come together and they would form a guild and they would elect somebody who would be in charge of that trade. And so all these different guilds would then come together to kind of discuss the economic situation of Florence. In my translation, Machiavelli doesn't call uh, the second class of citizens nobles, but uh, or magnates, which means people who uh, have like economic power or they're people of business. Um, so the guilds of Florence, uh, there were seven major guilds, which had the most power and the most money, and then uh, 14 minor guilds. So, so that only made up 20% of the population of Florence, and the other 80% did not belong to any guild. So they didn't really have any say about the economic state of the city. And then the Black Plague hits them, which was detrimental to their economy um, because a lot of the workers had died. And this kind of resulted in poverty and uh, taxes went higher, which meant a lot of people had to abandon their houses and their jobs. Um, but what it eventually also did was a lot of immigrants were coming in as the plague was spreading out and they became wealthy through trade. And that kind of put everybody who was a worker at a disadvantage. And so this revolt came about and it was kind of led by the wool makers who didn't have a say in the government at all. And this revolt kind of came into in three stages. So the first one was the reform where the wool makers kind of took up arms, they attacked the government building, the monasteries and the plazas, and they released all their inmates that were put in jail. The second uh, part of the revolt was uh, the part where the lower class citizens took over government completely and they formed three guilds and these guilds were there to provide the unemployed employment. So many people went into the wool production process um, just to kind of give everybody in income and stable home and they got rid of corporal uh, punishment and that kind of thing. Unfortunately, because they were doing all of this, it made the government unstable. This actually resulted in a lot of um, failure to the other guilds and the other guilds that had helped them and let them in felt betrayed. So the third part was the reaction where uh, the butchers decided they were going to fight the wool makers and they ended up killing them all. So that was the end of uh, the revolution. So this revolution only kind of stayed for four years but during those four years, the major players, or what Machiavelli says in his history of Florence, are the princes of uh, Florence at the time, were uh, Salvestro de' Medici, who was the head of the Judges and Lawyer Guild. Two generals were uh, Bendito Alberti and Tommaso Sorzi. And uh, Bendito really didn't like the revolt, and he was completely against it, whereas Tommaso was completely for it, and he was 
really supportive of the last person who's Giorgio Scali. So as we said, after the revolt happened, Giorgio Scali was put in place into power and he kind of took this opportunity. So he was taking justice into his own hand. He kind of used the armies of Tommaso um, to get revenge over all the officers that had done the poor harm. And this disrupted the peace. And so a lot of people didn't like it. And so he was put into trial uh, as well as Tommaso, but Tommaso ended up running away and he was behead beheaded for it. So Machiavelli uh, uses him as an example because he kind of overestimated how much they wanted revenge for the injustice that was happening um, and kind of took it into his own hand and that backfired, kind of like the Gracchi where um, they overestimated how much uh, people wanted to be involved in politics. They were kind of treating Rome as if it was Athens, but the people of Rome weren't Athenian. They didn't want liberty. They were somewhat happy with the situation. They were, they were happy to get stuff without being involved directly. And the same happened to Giorgio Scali. And that's the end. I'm just going back to the beginning. Do you guys have any, you know how he says there are three possible outcomes of this, mm -hmm. principality, liberty, or anarchy. Mm -hmm. He doesn't give examples of how this kind of dynamic between the people and the businessmen can lead to these three different kind of outcomes. Sure. I was wondering if you had any examples. Let's start with anarchy. What are we like defining as anarchy? When it came to this example, I always thought of the French Revolution and kind of mm. the consequences of it and exactly what happened after. But mm. I always kind of considered that as anarchy, but I'm not sure anymore. Yeah. I think you could define it as like uh, any period where there's like a major power vacuum. Mm. True. Yeah. That's the best way to put it. Because just because you have like a revolution, um, say for example, with the in China with the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party overthrowing uh, the nationalist. There was never any period where there wasn't any power. There was always, you know, those set laws. But, mm -hmm. you know, say for example, we are in Iraq where there's a period where there's no real authority, no one really in power. I think that's yeah. where you define as anarchy. Yeah. Liberty, are there any examples of that? The, uh, yeah, Chinese Communist Party um, kind of, overthrowing the nationalists and Xi Jinping and all them. So yeah, you know, the people they'd kind of been oppressed in a way for a long time. And a lot of their kind of issues had been ignored um, because the nationalists wanted to deal with Japan, which wasn't a problem at all. They were just annoyed. Um, so I guess, you know, people kind of being liberated in the sense that with the new ideology that was being proposed, which was communism, is a, a way that their voices would be heard, um, which we all know worked out wonderfully. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's one way you could kind of, uh, that's one example, I guess you could use, you know, people kind of seek to have their voices heard um, in a period where the kind of ruling power was kind of ignoring um, them and their kind of day-to-day -day struggles. I think a lot of those communist rules um, came about because of that feeling of liberty and then obviously they never really came to um, fruition. But um, I think that's how a lot of them started. Like there's kind of a pattern there. Yeah. The first one is uh, principalities. And like the first one that comes to my head is the British Civil War. The Roundheads wanted to get rid of the king in general. Oh, yes. Yes. In Parliament and then... They bring Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> yeah. Really nice for them. <laughs> I feel like it's very, very applicable. Like our governments today, they're not really run by people, politics, but people who have companies. Yeah. Exactly. Very much corporate. <laughs> mm -hmm. They really want to get richer, yeah? So, mm -hmm. yeah. The contradiction that Machiavelli makes and then he justifies the contradiction when he says that uh, if a prince is placed there by, say, the nobles or the businessmen, he needs to win the people. And the easiest way to win the people is by protecting them. Exactly. Um, and because you won't be successful without the people's uh, love. But then he makes the contradiction where he says, oh, 
he who builds on people is like someone who builds on mud. And he says that, oh yeah, this is true because if somebody who kind of attempts to get the trust of the people, believes that the people will save them at the end, is someone who is deceiving themselves and hasn't truly understood the people. And then he gives the two uh, latter examples um, to kind of justify his statement. I don't know how true it is that you need the people. It's good to have the love of the people, but someone who simply just controls the people can easily maintain their status. Like you don't need to have uh, love and support to keep a government afloat. Look around the world. There's so many governments that, you know, people are just like, hmm, we don't like you, we don't hate you. So they're still alive. That kind of um, tied in with how I saw like the previous chapter and how he kind of treated it and in this chapter, so chapter eight and nine, because like chapter eight, if you look at, say, for example, um, Agathocles, mm-hmm. um, he kind of like solidified his power quite quickly. He was able to kind of eradicate most of the competition, um, you know, without the love of the people, without anything like that, kind of just through, through kind of brute force. Yes. But um, Machiavelli doesn't like, he says, you know, that should only be done in like very, very specific circumstances and should be avoided if possible. When he lost his campaign in Africa, he went back and then Carthage kind of attacked. He really didn't have anybody there to protect him at the end. And that kind of comes back to this scenario where like, if you don't have the love of the people, if you think that the people that you have will support you, they're not going to, but see in kind of a <laughs> is example um his people didn't love him they were kind of tired of his useless conquests and here he's saying oh it, even if they love you it's futile so why try to gain their love hmm. if it's futile either way i think just to, so you don't have um like revolutions or um what do you call it when people rise against the prince I, I can see it as he's taking a dig at princes. He's saying that whatever kind of prince you are, it's not going to work because the people are just going to be there. Um, they're never really going to take your side unless you benefit them. Mm. So he's kind of saying that, you know, having a principality doesn't really mean anything because the people are who make you and break you. And the people don't really value in any certain way unless you defend them unless you sort of protect them see so it's back to their own interests true so i think yeah. machiavelli is just saying that you know whatever you end up doing you're you're always going to be alone mm. in what you're you're trying to do which goes back to what he says in the end, because in the end he says, try to always maintain that authority um, to you and not let you know magistrates or other people or like ministers have the authority. This way you can always ensure that the people or the common people always in need for you. So they maintain their loyalty to you, which ties yeah, yeah. back to what you said. And he says that, you know, you can't really keep a civil uh, principality. You have to, at one stage or another, try to kind of change it into an absolute principality, which only belongs to you kind of thing. But that transition process is very dangerous because you're going to offend somebody. Exactly. Those Um, people who are... The example that came to my head instantly was Julius Caesar. So he kind of let the Senate and that kind of thing. And then he was like, no, I'm going to be the dictator. And that's kind of the end of it. And he ended up getting murdered. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think uh, the, this is like, a, I don't know if it's a saying or something, but it just came to mind. It's like whoever takes uh, the shoulders of people as a throne, his end will be falling down. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of, if, you know, the people, you can never make everyone happy. So it's either he built it like in chapter eight and just be cruel and, you know, try try and, uh, you know, rule your principality with the sword, you know, because uh, it's you're going to back the normal people up. The businessman might not take it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what kind of brings us back to, say, for example, Imam Ali. The people at the time, the, most of the companions, are, they couldn't handle the uh, the adul of Imam Amir al-Mu'min, 
And that's yeah. why, we, you know, who's giving, you know, the rich and the poor kind of the same and, you know, the Farisi and the Ara- Arabi and stuff like that. So I think a businessman would never be like to be treated like normal people. So exactly. Kind of, yeah. All those people are in power. Is like this is how he when he talks about how to deal with the nobles when he says those ones who are uh, who show dependency on you and they tie your success to your success and they show their inclination always to the success of the state those ones you should honor them you should love them and yeah. like you can sort of draw that uh, that relation to how Imam Ali sort of dealt with with uh, people in his estate like Malik al Ashtar or. Salman al Farisi. And then, yeah, and when Machiavelli goes and says, those people who are sort of show like independency, or, you, you need to look at, dig down uh, the reason why they acting in this way. If they are just scared from you or they are covered, then you can just take their advice. And if they are just because they sort of doing, um, you know, because they are planning their own plans and trying to sort of, um, you know, planning for their own success, if you like, and their own, their own agenda. Those are the ones that you need to keep an eye on. And mm-hmm. if you, we go back and link it to Imam Ali again, Imam Ali had such examples who they wanted to have their own agenda, like Falha and Zubair. So they, they wanted to be there or um, they even voted for Imam Ali in the first place and they wanted him to be the, the Khalif. Um, but you know, that's for their own agenda and therefore their own personal gain, not for the sake of Islamic State, if you like. Yeah, I feel like yeah, this, it's an, it, this one's a very applicable and interesting chapter in that regard. Yeah, it's just an interesting quote. It's kind of towards the end, though. Mm-hmm. Um, it says, when things are quiet, everyone dances, attendance, everyone makes promises and everyone will die for him so long as death is far off. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a bit more to it, but that's the main part. I think that was really interesting. And, and I thought that's a really applicable one, especially you can apply it both to the time of Imam Hussein and also to the time of Imam Mehdi when he um, things happen and people say the claim one thing, but then when reality is <laughs> here, they act differently. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And how to test the loyalty of the people is to test them not on the times of peace, but in times of danger. That's an important one. Absolutely. We can see a lot of people today, unfortunately, people in our community, our friends, who, you know, would be with us when times are easy, but then when times are difficult or things are changing in society, you find them switching sides. to protect their image rather than thinking of the common or the final goal. Yeah. Again, because, you know, this is sort of the human nature because once we feel like, you know, our ego is attacked or our, you know, social status is attacked. Oh, like, you know, you know, I'm going to be like, you know, demolished. So no, I cannot be involved in this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. We always have that need to defend ourselves. Exactly. And make sure yep. everyone sees us in the way that we want to be mm-hmm. seen. Like you know, it's just trying to avoid conflict, but in reality, you're causing that more internal conflict within you, and that's probably mm-hmm. more dangerous. Yeah. And like Machiavelli in future chapters is going to go over this whole image idea and how we should be perceived by people. Uh, But for today, that is the end of our session. Inshallah, next week we'll be looking at chapters 10 and 11. So how to perceive principalities and then uh, religious kind of institutions. So we'll, we'll hope to see you all next week, inshallah.